Good morning, everyone. So we're going to start some new slides today. We're going to look at graph and graph algorithms. The next uh, lecture is going to be about minimum spanning trees, which is also graph algorithms. And then we're going to talk about, uh, let's see what comes after that, algorithm families. And then we're going to be doing backtracking, branch and bound, and traveling salesperson problem. So these are all things that are going to be coming up on project four. Yes, I know Project 3 is still working on that, but uh, Project 4 is coming out on Wednesday. We'll have MST, which is part of it, done before that, and we'll be doing TSP the next day. Now, on the first slide here, we've got a picture of the game Settlers of Catan, and we're going to see there's a couple different pictures of different games in here because it turns out that a lot of games involve graphs and connecting things together. Another example here is Ticket to Ride, which is a game where you lay railroad tracks across the country. I also played a couple months ago, I played a um, Ticket to Ride Europe where uh, someone actually ended up creating like a railway going from like London over to Siberia or something like that. So the, it involves laying these tracks and, and train routes. The similar example that we're going to use a lot today is this graph of airline routes. And you see we have these three letter codes for airports like Chicago O'Hare, Miami, etc. and numbers connecting them. And the numbers could be miles, it could be dollars for a ticket, it could be some measure of time spent. The what the number represents doesn't matter, but we'll talk about algorithms and optimization and how those numbers come into play in different cases. So before we get too much into graph theory, we need a definition of a graph. So a graph is a set of vertices and edges, and the edges really can be thought of as a, a pair of, of items, or we could say they are sets of size two, a pair of items, that, so the edges could be just pairs of vertices to show that there uh, is a connection between those two vertices. Now, when we look at a tree here, remember when we talked about trees, we said that the trees were a type of graph that had no cycles, was one thing about them, and so is this a graph? Sure, it's still a graph. It's just a graph that doesn't have any cycles. Some cycles have graphs, some don't. The ones that don't are still graphs, but more specifically, they are trees. If I add in a cycle between multiple nodes, or even between a node being connected to itself, it's still a graph. If we make multiple ways to get from one location to another, it's still a graph. If we have one region that cannot be reached from another, still a graph. And there are different things that we can do with these different graph representations. Now, in general, so in a previous picture, we had parallel edges and self loops. So if we go back to slides. so redo the markings on here. So these right here are parallel edges. We have two different connections from one node to another. Now, so a cycle is when we can get from one node to another different ways by going different, completely different routes. Parallel edges are two nodes are connected by two or more edges. You know, we could have three or four edges here connecting those. A self edge is this one down here where 48 is connected to itself. Now those are allowed in graphs. Um, however, if we eliminate those two possibilities, then we would refer to it as a simple graph. And so for the most part, for the rest of the semester, if we don't say otherwise, you can assume it's a simple graph. And this makes things a little bit restricted because like in our airline routes, you might say, wait, wouldn't uh, parallel edges be something reasonable because then different airlines 
could fly the same route, say, for different dollars. So if those if those were dollar amounts, then yeah, it would kind of make sense that we'd allow parallel edges. Um, self edges, though, are in a lot of real world situations are not. It's not too big of a deal to remove that restriction because it's uh, there aren't a lot of airports where you go buy a plane ticket to get on the plane, fly around for an hour, and land where you started. Although parallel edges does seem a little bit more like something we would see. Um, by removing these restrictions, though, we'll make the algorithms easier to analyze in complexity. Okay, so is this one a graph? Uh, is this one a simple graph? So, no, this isn't a simple graph because it's got a self-edge. It still has two separate regions of the graph that are not connected to each other, but there's only that one self-edge preventing it from being a simple graph. If we eliminate that self-edge, it's a simple graph, however it is disconnected. So there are some vertices that cannot be reached from some other vertices. That's a disconnected graph. Um, also, we're going to have a lot of definitions here before we get to much of the algorithms. So we might also want to have a simple path. So a simple path is when we have some sequence of edges leading from one vertex to another, and we have no vertex appearing twice. So if I was, let's say we were back on North Campus, if I was going to Uh, no, so those were not trees because they don't have, because generally trees need to be connected. So if we were back on North Campus and I said, hey, I've got to walk from Beister over to Pierpont and get some food. I might take different routes. I might go through, say, the um, Stamps Building because it's raining. Maybe I'll cut through there to stay out of the rain a little longer. Or I might go the long way around. I might take the loop going over to the east, like over towards the Eeks building and walk across the, in front of the dude just because I want a more scenic, uh, scenic route and more to see before I go eat my lunch. But usually, in a simple path, any, at least, we're not going to say, ooh, I'll walk from Beister over to Eeks, over to Pierpont, back to Eeks, back to Pierpont, back to Eeks and over to Pierpont and stay there, that would not be a simple path because I repeated vertices more than once. So a simple path doesn't have anything repeated. In a connected graph, we would say that there is a simple path between any pair of vertices. If you pick any pair, there is a path. We could replace the word any here with every. Every pair means the same thing. So a connected graph, there is a simple path between every pair of vertices. Now, we are also going to look at things like a cycle. Like I might go from my office, walk past Eeks, walk past the Duderstadt, go into Pierpont, get my lunch, and then when I walk back, I would take a different route. I'd go, say, in front of Stamps and over to Beister. So a cycle is like a simple path, except that only the first and final nodes are the same. So if I went the same route both directions, <clears throat> excuse me, if I went the same route in both directions, that wouldn't be considered a cycle. A few more definitions. We might have a directed graph where edges have a direction. We might have an undirected graph where there are unordered pairs. There are just a connection between two vertices. Now, in the directed graph, when we have these uh, pairs such as u comma v, it means there is an edge from u to v. And one other thing, if I had, let's say I had u and I had v, so I have these two vertices, I could have an edge here and an edge there this is still a simple graph because these edges are not parallel because they differ in direction. 
So that would still be a simple graph if they, if they go in opposite directions between u and v. In an undirected graph, we would say, hey, there's an edge from u, or there's better yet, an edge between u and v without any arrows, means you can follow that edge in either direction. And the order is not important. When we list them as u comma v, it does mean that the order is important in a, in a directed graph. So there's uh, just two examples here of the same edges with and without arrows. And I know probably at your size of screen, it might be a little bit hard to see. So there's, there's the arrows drawn in a little bit more clearly. Um, in the directed graph, it turns out if we were to start at, say, vertex 3, we cannot get back to 3. I, once I leave 3, there's no way to get back. I can go between 1, 2, and 4. I can go around in a circle. But if I ever go to 5, I cannot leave. There's no edge leaving vertex 5. Uh, somebody's mowing again. Hold on just a sec. Let me see if the window's still open. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Front door, actually. Okay, we're working. All right, so we got our directed graphs. Now, another property of a graph could be an edge weight. So with an edge weight, we can think of an edge weight as the distance between two vertices or nodes. I will tend to use those terms interchangeably, vertex node, vertex node. Um, the one issue with weight is that no matter what word we use for it, it tends to produce a connotation in your mind. So if I were to say cost, you might think dollars. And if I say weight, you might think pounds or kilograms, depending on where you're from. If we just think of it as a number that we have to account for in our, in our uh, analysis, it's it's harder to say words like that. It's easy to say cost and minimum cost and things like that. So we will tend to use words like the cost of an edge and the least cost, even though it may not mean dollars. It may mean miles. So there's lots of, of ways to say it. We could call it weight, we could call it cost. I think our slides send, tend to say cost. Now, in an undirected graph, the weights might be different for parallel edges. That would be similar to our um, multiple planes fly this route. And so it, uh, since it's not a simple graph, I can have multiple parallel edges and they could have a different weight for each one of them. Now, some of our algorithms are going to look for a path or a cycle, and some of them are going to look for a least cost path. Now, there is the possibility that we might also want to do a highest cost, or better yet, highest value. So there's some graph algorithms where we're going to try to maximize the value of something. So again, there's these terms. When I say cost, you say, well, why would you want to maximize the cost of something? But if I say value, it still represents dollars but it gives you a different connotation. So we have to be a little bit careful with what we call things just so that they make sense. So many of our graph algorithms will try to minimize the sum of those numbers, and some of our algorithms will try to maximize them. It depends on what, we're, what problem we're trying to solve. So we've got our graph here came back, we want to know, is this directed or undirected? Well, if we look at all of the endpoints around each of the nodes, I don't see an arrow anywhere. So this has got to be an undirected graph. And since there are numbers associated with every edge, it must be a weighted graph. 
So like I said, we'll tend to use these terms in odd ways, like almost everyone will say weighted graph, even though it might represent a cost. Now, when we calculate the complexity, the complexity of a Giffen algorithm might depend upon the number of edges, it might depend on the number of vertices, it might depend on both and some combination of them. We will tend to write things like, say, O of E squared. Now that's equivalent to saying O of the size of the set containing E squared. We tend to write it the way on the left just because it's easier to write. So really, yes, technically E is a set and V is a set, but we tend to write the complexity without the size of the set bars just for convenience sake. Now, if we're looking at a complete graph, complete meaning every possible edge exists. So if, we, if we've got a complete graph, every possible edge does exist. So every, every pair of ver every vertex is connected by an edge to every other vertex. So then the number of edges there is equal to the number of vertices times v minus 1 divided by 2. And that's proportional to v squared. Now, one thing about this is because we didn't say otherwise, we can assume we're talking about a simple graph. If we didn't assume it was a simple graph, then all possible edges, there's an infinite number. There could be 50 edges from A to B or a million edges from A to B. So that's one of the reasons that we make a requirement of simple graphs is that without that requirement, we can't get a handle on the number of possible edges in a graph. Now, a complete graph, like we said, would have V times V minus 1 over 2 edges. In a dense graph, we said here E is proportional to V squared. And we will represent it later on. We're going to look at real soon how to represent it as an adjacency matrix. And when we have a sparse graph, it says E is, this means, much less than. Not that it's reading from there. It's much less than V squared, or we could say that E is proportional to V. And when we look at representations, we could represent this as an adjacency list. Now, there is no solid line that I can draw between these two. It's kind of a fuzzy line. And really what it comes down to is, for a particular algorithm, I might say, well, if I know it's a sparse graph, I will use this version. And if I know it's a dense graph, I'll use that version because they'll have slightly different complexities. And if you pick wrong, then you will have possibly a different limit on the complexity than you were hoping for. So like I said, there's no real hard and fast line between what is dense and what is sparse. But it's sort of giving a, a feeling for how many edges there are in the graph and then you might use a different algorithm depending on whether your input is, is dense or sparse. Now, with five vertices, it gets even vaguer. So a complete graph, no argument. Every vertex is connected to every other vertex. In a dense graph, you can see... Uh, and Actually, let's go to the complete graph. So I got five vertices. I know the number of edges is equal to 10. And in the dense graph here, it looks like we removed two edges, possibly. One, two, yeah. So edges, number of edges is equal to eight, I think. Okay. And over here in our sparse graph, the number of edges is equal to one, two, three, four, five. So like we said, in the complete graph, we know the exact number. In the sparse graph, the number of edges is proportional to the number of vertices. And in the dense graph, 
in, with five vertices, it really doesn't matter because the complexity will change so little with five vertices that it's uh, irrelevant which one we call it. But since it's, I would say, closer to complete than it is to sparse, then I'd call it, uh, call it dense. Now, this graph here, is this a complete graph? Well, it can't be complete because I can see, hey, there's no connection from 17 to 50. Okay, so it can't be complete. Is it sparse or dense? Well, it is. One other thing we can say is it is connected. It is connected. And the number of edges, so let's see, we've got how many vertices do we have? We've got vertices equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we've got edges equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. In fact, that's the minimum number possible to still be connected. This is a tree. So a tree, a tree will always have E equal to V minus 1. And again, we're leaving off the size of the set on all of these. So a tree is basically as sparse as you can get. Because if we removed even one more edge, it wouldn't even be connected anymore. So it is sparse. If it's sparse, it can't be dense. Now we've got here an adjacency matrix. So what this is saying is, tell me whether there's an edge between two vertices. Now we look back at our original graph. The graph down here is undirected. So you'll notice that our adjacency matrix doesn't say which direction is from or to. So we could, I tend to, I tend to think of the rows as from and the columns as to, just because that's how I think of it. But we don't have to follow that um, assignment in an undirected graph. In an undirected graph, you can think of it in in whatever way makes sense to you. However, notice that if I want to traverse between SFO and LAX, there's a one here and there's a one there because the connection exists in both directions. It's undirected. Now, two things about this uh, adjacency matrix. One is that although we would probably represent this with Booleans, which would be true and false, I found when I put the words true and false in this table, it was much harder to see it at a glance what was what was where, because the words are uh, make it harder to read. So I changed it to one and zero, one meaning there is a connection, zero means there's no connection, just because it was easier to read. I suppose if we had gone with true false, maybe different colors would have worked to make it clearer, but being colorblind, that's not my go-to solution for things. So we put ones and zeros in here to indicate there is a connection between them. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. If there's a connection between them, couldn't we eliminate half of that graph? Because, well, we know, since it's a simple graph, you didn't say otherwise, it must be a simple graph. If it's a simple graph, I really don't need the diagonal and everything above the diagonal or below it, it doesn't matter, we can get rid of either one, above is easier in terms of indexing, all of that's redundant information. I could get at it if I had less than half the memory used. True, but now when you want to look up something, so someone asks you the question, is there a flight from ORD to BOS? You say, oh, well, I think of the rows as from. I'll go to the ORD row. I'll go over to the BOS column, and it doesn't exist. So now you've got to say, oh, well, the from and to really don't mean anything. Now I've got to figure out if, if the second one 
Boston is a higher index than the first one, then I got to do the higher index first, and it's painful. So for cutting the memory in half, I would say not a big deal. I'd rather write simpler code. I'd rather just keep this thing with the whole matrix there with everything above below the diagonal even though it's redundant and there's useless information along the diagonal it makes it easier to write code to go look things up oops i think i'm trying to draw with my finger okay now if we take the numbers and we put the numbers into this distance matrix the in terms of true or falseness they still make sense zero means there's no connection a number bigger than zero means there is a connection but if we're trying to do something if we're trying to write some algorithm that minimize things we'd have to be really careful because those zeros now mean not that it's free it means that you can't go that way so we'd have to be really careful with that if we put zeros in there so we're going to look at a better alternative in a minute Now, and again, with our connection uh, LAX to SFO, 337 over here in the graph ends up being in two places in our distance matrix. Now, the adjacency list is actually the part down here at the bottom. I put the table at the top to remind us of the data, um, and in the bottom, here we've got the adjacency list representation. Now the color here is important because the linked list here doesn't order doesn't matter except for the very first one. The very first one is our starting point and after that after the starting point the order doesn't matter. So what this one is saying is SFO if you start at SFO you can go to any one of these places. They are adjacent. And we could, if we wanted to, we could put, uh, we could make it a weighted adjacency list by putting numbers in each of these. So I could put a 337 with that one, uh, 1464 with this one, etc. So we could put numbers in there if we wanted to. So we've got a starting point of SFO. The adjacency list says, starting from SFO, you can reach everybody else in the list. But it does, it, the ordering doesn't mean anything. I just, when I did the adjacency list, I went from left to right in my, in my adjacency matrix to create the list. And there would be the dot, dot, dot down here means, hey, we've got to have more of these lists. Now notice again, the symmetric pairs that go with different directions are both in there. So we have SFO has an entry for LAX, LAX has an entry for SFO, because if you start at LAX, if that is your starting point, you can go to anyone in that list. So you'll see that in the undirected graph, and we'll see this in a formula in a minute, in the undirected graph, everyone appears twice. They appear twice in the distance, matrix or the adjacency matrix, they appear twice in the adjacency list or the, uh, we could call it a distance list or a weighted adjacency list. So because it's an un undirected graph to begin with, everything appears twice. So when we use an adjacency matrix, we can simply, like we said, we could cut the size down if we get rid of the diagonal and get rid of the duplicate area, but the simplest way to do it is to just make it size V times V. In a directed graph, there is a from and to, and we would have to know which one is which. Does the row mean from? Does the row mean to? We have to make that decision. In an undirected graph, we could cut the space by a little over half, but then that makes it harder to work with. In the unweighted, so if we've got an unweighted versus a weighted graph, in the unweighted graph we said 0 and 1. In a weighted graph what would be better is if we said infinity rather than 0. Would make things easier for us when we start to 
run algorithms that try to, say, minimize things, we would want that infinity to stop us from using it. So here I redrew the uh, distance matrix by putting in infinity for all of those zeros. Now, how can we do that in numbers in C++? Well, it turns out that if we include the library known as limits, we can ask for numeric limits of a type colon colon a property. So, all types have things like colon colon max, colon colon min, and those give us the minimum and maximum value for that type. There is actually a, another one that, that everybody has, colon colon has underscore infinity. And that one, strangely, does not have parentheses. It's just a value. So has infinity tells you, does it have a, not does infinity parentheses exist, but it tells you really what, what has infinity means is the infinity returns something different from max. So for things like an integer type, an int max and int infinity are the same value. The place that infinity is different really is for double and float. Double and float have infinity, which means their representation of infinity is different from their representation of the maximum value for that type. Now the nice thing about those types, float and double, is when you take infinity, as long as you do something with infinity and a non-infinity, it stays infinity. You take infinity, you add 5 to it, you've still got infinity. Uh, you take infinity, multiply by 5, it's still infinity. Visual Studio does a weird job here. It plays differently from G++, where if you do things that would result in 0 or uh, not a number in G++, or, sorry, if you re do things that, like multiplying 0, but... Uh, multiplying infinity by zero in Visual Studio results in not a, a results in zero in Visual Studio, it results in not a number in G++. So normal things like adding an integer, subtracting an integer, multiplying an integer, it stays infinity. Infinity divided by infinity in Visual Studio, it says one, G++ says it's not a number. If we subtract infinity minus infinity, Visual Studio says, zero. G++ says that's not a number because it's not well defined. Generally, we don't have to worry about this. Um, and things that have infinity, the algorithms that we're going to do usually don't do these things. They usually do things like add one value to another. So we don't usually have to worry th about things like subtracting an infinity, dividing by an infinity, moduloing an infinity. Most of the things that we're going to do are going to produce infinity in either system, in either Visual Studio or G++. Uh, we don't want to use numeric limits of double max because double has infinity, and it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, infinity is greater than everything except itself. If you say, is infinity equal to infinity? It says yes. Is anything greater than is anything greater than infinity no is anything that's not infinity less than infinity yes so the tests make sense so we're going to use this in some of our graph algorithms especially our implementations of these for project four you're going to want to come back to double numeric limits of double infinity when you're working on project four Now, when we look at having the, our data structures, an adjacency list, when we create an adjacency list, remember we said we would do this if the graph is sparse. If the graph is dense, then it will take more room to do the adjacency list than it would do the adjacency matrix. And we would have more 
um, and we would have a higher uh, complexity than we want. So if we've got a sparse graph though, we want to represent it as an adjacency list. Now, when we make an adjacency list, this is kind of like when we did um, hash tables. We're looking at often the average case. So here, the average case, what we're going to say is that um, every vertex list has about E divided by V edges. So what we're saying is the, the edges are distributed randomly across the vertices. So for instance, if I had a graph that looked like this, This one doesn't look like our average. There's one vertex that has V minus one connections and every other vertex has exactly one. So this is unusual. This is not our typical uh, uniform or random distribution of edges over the vertices. Now it says up here, approximately E divided by V edges on each vertex list. Really, if it's undirected, it should be approximately 2e divided by v. Because remember, everything appears twice. SFO you, uh, is connected to LAX. LAX is connected to F SFO. So every, in an undirected graph, every edge in the graph appears in an adjacency list in two places. Now, it says here, if we want to access a vertex list, that's O of 1. What we mean by that is we're assuming that we can get to the head of one of these linked lists in O of 1 time. And we sort of glossed over this with the adjacency matrix. So we're assuming we can go O of 1, we can go to any uh, row in the adjacency matrix. We have an assumption that we can have O of 1 time to access any row, O of 1 time to access a particular column within that row. So we, we made that assumption, we sort of glossed over that. So to get to the head of a vertex list is O of 1. If I want to know, is this edge in the vertex list? it's O of E divided by V to traverse that whole list. So if we had our adjacency list, let's see. here's an example of it. If I said, hey, is, uh, can you go from SFO to MIA? And direction doesn't matter. Well, if I want to answer that question, I've got to go to the head of the SFO list, that's O of 1, and then I have to traverse this whole list. The length of this list is proportional to O of E divided by V in the average case. So that's how long the average list is. So that's what we're getting at in this slide. So the time to get to the head of the list is O of 1. To traverse that list once we get there is O of E divided by V. And so if I want to say, hey, uh, I want to go to a particular vertex and traverse the whole list, it would be O of e plus, uh, 1 plus E divided by V. O of 1 to get to the head, E divided by V to traverse the list. Now if I said, uh, hey, I want you to print out everything in your adjacency list. Well to do that you would have to go to the head of every vertex. So for every vertex. I want to go to the head of the list and I want to traverse the whole list printing everything out. And so the total cost is, we multiply this out, O of V plus E. Now in the adjacency list, our features, feature comparison, so in the directed adjacency list, every edge in the graph appears in one edge list. In an undirected graph, every edge in the graph appears twice in the adjacency lists. And we went through that one like here with 
SFO has an LAX entry, LAX has an F SFO entry. Because we started with an undirected graph, everybody has to appear twice. Now, here in the adjacency list, we don't actually need a special representation for infinity. If the, in the unweighted graph, if there's no edge, then the edge didn't exist in the graph, even if it's weighted. If there's no edge, it means it didn't exist in the graph. And if the edge does exist in the adjacency list, it did exist in the original graph. So just the presence of or absence of an edge gives us the ability to do it without needing a representation for infinity. Or even a true false. We just look, is it in the list? Yes, then you can, you can have, uh, follow that edge. Okay, so now for this question, if I've got all of these things are three letter abbreviations, then how can we say that it's O of one to get to this thing? Well, after working on project three a lot, sorry, I need to drink water. After working on project three a lot, your go-to source, your go-to answer for this one is a hash table. We could make the a hash table to say, hey, I've got a hash table that goes from keys which are strings to linked lists containing, say, strings. So we can always do this in O of one time. What about the adjacency matrix? How could we do this in O of one time? Well, we could have a hash table of hash tables, but that would get really, really big on memory. What would be better here is what we could do is we could say, hey, I've got a hash table that goes from string to unsigned int in the range 0 to n. So I take a string like uh, LAX, I put it into the unordered map, what comes out is 1, and I say, oh, LAX is at index 1. So a hash table of hash tables would work, but it would be a big memory hog because hash tables are already using a lot of memory. And if we put hash tables inside of hash tables, it gets even compounded more. Okay, so what we've got here is a couple of questions, and I'm going to take a short pause. I may not get to the point where I see people typing answers, but what I want you to do is think about this before I give you the answer. So we've got our task. We've got to determine whether a nonstop flight from X to Y exists. And we know it's an unordered graph, so it doesn't matter whether we think of the rows in the, in the adjacency matrix as from or to, you can still answer the question. It's symmetric. So we want to know, can we determine if a, flight, a nonstop flight from X to Y exists? Well, yes, we can. The better question is, what's the complexity? So start thinking about this, and we want to do worst and best and average for each of these. So I'll start making headings while you start thinking about it. Oh, actually, I'm going to leave a little more room between those. Okay, so let's work on the adjacency matrix first. And I see I'm starting to get answers there. So when we go to the adjacency matrix, I want to know from X to Y. Well, I can get to row X in O of one time. Once I'm in row X, I can get to, from, to column Y in O of one time. So this was an easy, easy question to answer with an adjacency matrix. For the adjacency list, I still have to get to the head of the linked list 
and I then have to traverse the whole list. So in the best case, let's do best case first. In the best case, I get to the head of the linked list and then I discover, oh look, there it is at the head. It's the very first one. Now, in the worst case, I've got to get to the head of the linked list, plus I have to traverse the whole list. Well, what is the worst possible length of that list is v minus 1. Or we could just say O of 1 plus v, or we could just say O of v. It all comes down to about the same thing. For the average, though, we've still got to get to the head of that linked list. Then we've got to traverse the list. Well, we said if we assume that the edges are randomly distributed, then the average length of one of these linked lists is E divided by V. Okay, so that's that question. Now let's move on to the next question. So. I say I give you an airport X and you have to answer the question what is the closest other airport to that airport? So we're going to do the same thing. Worst, best, average for each representation. So I'll make headings while you start thinking about it. Okay, so how about for our adjacency matrix? If I said, say, hey, uh, Miami, what's the closest other airport to Miami? You go to the MIA row, and then you see an infinity. Well, that's the be it's the best so far. Another approach would be to say, hey, I know the best so far is infinity. Before I ever look at anything, let's find out if anyone in that row has a better value than infinity. So, so we could say the first one is the best so far, or we could say infinity is the best so far. Let's look at all of them. Either way works. So in the worst case, I've got to look at all V of those entries within that MIA row to find the smallest one. Well, what about the best? I could find... Okay, I say, well, I assume infinity is, is the best because I haven't seen any data. Then I see like numbers like 700, 600, 500, 400, 300. I've still got to do all of them before I know which one is the smallest. Well, if the worst is O of V and the best is O of V, then the average can't be anything different. So if worst and best are the same, the average has to be the same as those two. All right, what about the adjacency list? Well, in the adjacency list, the worst is going to be, hey, I've got to get to the head of the list. Whoops, I put my parenthesis O instead of O parenthesis. So O of 1 plus, well, V minus 1 is the maximum length of that linked list, which is equal to O of V. All right, what about the best? The, what would be the best case? So in the best case, I would get to the list and maybe the list is empty and I can say there is no closest airport. Or maybe I get to the list and the list is of length 1. So in the best case, we would get O of 1. We get to the linked list and it's either empty or there's only one entry within that uh, to that connected to that airport. I'm done. Okay, what about the average? O of 1 to get to the head of the linked list. I've got to traverse the whole list. Well, the average list is length e divided by v. So we're going to see this particular formula 
comes up a lot when we're dealing with adjacency lists. Okay, next question. I want to know if any flights are leaving this particular airport today. Or alternately, we could say coming into. Are any flights arriving at this airport today? Because we know the weather's bad at that airport. We just want to know if, if anybody's going to be making it uh, arriving today. So go through this one. So I give you the airport. We want to know if there's any flights departing or arriving. Doesn't matter. Directionality doesn't matter because we've got an undirected graph. So start working on that one. I'll make headings. And the adjacency matrix average is going to be a little bit harder. We're going to have to talk about that one a bit. I'd say that's the hardest one we've done so far is going to be the adjacency matrix average. Okay, so I want to determine if any flights are arriving at a particular airport today. So I go to the row for that airport in the adjacency matrix. Maybe I pick JFK, and I have to start looking. I see infinity, infinity, infinity. Maybe it was infinities all the way to the end. Maybe there was only one, and it was the last one. Or maybe they were all infinity. Could be O of V. The best case would be, hey, I pick someone like LAX. I get to the LAX row, very first place I look, there's some, there is something there. Now let's come back to adjacency matrix average. Like I said, that's going to be the worst one. How about adjacency list? In the worst case, I get to the head of the linked list and there's either something there or there's nothing there. If the linked list is empty, I can say false. If the linked list is not empty, I can say true. So worst case, O of 1. Well, if the worst case is O of 1, the best can't be any better than that. The average can't be any different from those. O of 1 all the way down. Real easy to do with an adjacency list. Now let's come back to the adjacency matrix. This one's a little bit harder to answer because we didn't know what the probability of encountering an infinity is. So if, let's say, that the table is about half full, well then, a row might, the average row might look like JFK, where there's infinity, 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 and the three values that exist come after that. Or maybe it's like DFW, where the non-infinities come first. So this one is really hard to get at. Would it be, uh, if it's an adjacency matrix, one thing we can say, if, an, if it's an adjacency matrix, it's probably not sparse. And if it's not sparse, then I've got some non-zero probability of finding uh, an entry in this, in this row of the matrix. But it could be anywhere from like O of 1 to O of V, depending on how sparse the, gra the graph is right now. Depending on how many connections there are, it could be anywhere in that range. Well, expected value would be nice, but to do that, I need to know the probability that a given lo that a given flight exists or not. So, if I had that probability, we could get an expected value. But without that probability, we didn't know. I would tend to say it's O of V on this one. We know we know it's got to be somewhere between worst and best so that wasn't too too hard that we you know we came up with we thought a lot about what is the range of the average well it's the range is worst to best i would tend to say this one's around o of v but it really depends if there are if a lot of flights exist 
I'm unlikely to find a row of infinities all the way out to the last one. Okay, now what if we associate a cost and we start talking about the cost to do something? Now, uh, so far we've been asking just does something exist or what is the least uh, the least uh, distance with the, yeah, we did the least distance. So if we associated another number with every edge, so every edge has two numbers. So it has like the um, distance, so the first number might be distance, and the second number might be dollars. So I'm at JFK, which is in New York, and I want to leave, I want to get as far away from here relative to the amount of dollars that I spend as possible. So I want to determine the best distance for the lowest cost for JFK on a non-stop flight. So I just want, I want one flight out of New York. I want to get as far away as I can, as cheaply as I can. So what about the complexity of this? So this one, we're going to have uh, a best worst average for each one. Now, if we go back to this one, where we're trying to find the closest, well, we're trying to find, here we're trying to find the highest distance divided by cost. Well, if I said closest or furthest here, the answer would be the same. If I say the, if I say the best ratio, of miles divided by dollars, it's still actually the same because we still have to do the same amount of work. Uh, the, we have to visit the same amount of items in the adjacency matrix or in the adjacency list. It's just that at every one that we encounter that's not infinity, we have to do a division. So we've increased the constant factor, but the big O is the same. So if we want to determine the best ratio, miles divided by dollars, then we can still do it in the same time as the finding the nearest or finding the furthest. We just have a different constant factor with each node that we check. Okay, what about if we want to talk about a route? Not just one nonstop flight from A to B, but I want the best way. I want the best way to get, to, say, from uh, San Francisco to Boston, from SFO to BOS. I want the best way to get from SFO to Boston with the lowest cost. Let's, let's say these were dollars. So I want the lowest cost. We don't have what we need to do this yet. So this is called single source shortest path. We've got a short mention of it on the next slide. We're going to have a, a lecture on it in the future. So single source shortest path, we can, we want to find the shortest path from any vertex to uh, some other vertex. And if we do a depth first search, it works on trees. Um, if we do a breadth first search, it will, so the depth first search, it only works on trees. We've got to be really careful. If there are multiple paths, we've got to make sure that we don't loop then infinitely. So we I should really it's it should say it, it works easier on trees. We we've got to have we've got to make sure that if there's multiple paths we don't get stuck in infinite loops. If we do a breadth first search it will so the depth first search will not only work it'll give us the right answer in a tree. In a breadth first search if the weights are all the same if I just want to say uh, I want to do it with the least number of layovers. So therefore, every flight is the same cost. Every flight has a cost of one because every flight beyond the first adds one layover. So if I say that every cost, every flight has the same cost, a breadth first search will do, meaning we used a Q-based approach. So a Q-based approach will find the shortest path, assuming that all weights are the same. 
if you look at your uh, project one, project this project one is slightly different in that respect because we stopped when we got to an island and then searched the island. So if we had something like, if I had an island that was shaped like this. So if I had an island shaped like this and I start here and I'm trying to get to, uh, that's no, that one doesn't work. Let me redo that. Uh, Yeah, let's say, uh, let's do this. Let's do like a U-shaped. would be a little bit easier to see. Okay. So I sail, and I start my sailing right here is my starting point. If I start sailing, I will find this one first because it's closer. So sailing, I reach that first. But then I had to go, all, the, the first mate had to go all the way around the island. But if I had taken a little bit longer sailing path, I would have gotten, if this was the treasure was over here, if I had taken a little bit longer sailing path, I would have had a lot shorter overall. So in, in our treasure hunt project one, if you use a cue for both the first mate and the captain, the, fir the captain will always find the shortest path to get to the island with the treasure. The first mate will always find the shortest path on that island, even though overall the, the overall path length might come out a little bit longer because we, we stopped when we got to the island and then searched the whole island. So if we use cues for both, the, the captain will find the closest place to get to the island and the first mate will find the, the shortest path to reach the treasure. If we use a stack, though, it might or might not. We might get lucky, we might not. Now, beyond those, we're going to look at, in a future lecture, we're going to look at Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm solves this without any constraint. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, there are, there are, uh, there's a very simple constraint, but it's not that unreasonable. But the uh, we don't have these constraints of multiple paths, all the weights are the same, etc. So Dijkstra's algorithm with one small cons with one small constraint on the data will always find the shortest path. Now there's a diagram here just demonstrating another thing about the depth first versus breadth first. So let's say I was trying to get from let's say a to F. A depth first search would do a lot of a lot more searching before it found it, where uh, the breadth first search would go down and then it would go sideways. Basically, we've looked at we've looked at everyone that's a distance of zero. Then we looked at everyone that's a distance of one. Then we looked at everyone that's a distance of two away from the starting point. So that's why the breadth first search will find the shortest if all the weights are the same. So if every weight is the same, the breadth first search will find the minimum. Because if I can find it at a distance 2, I'll never consider a distance 3. Okay, so if we have a graph, if I want to discover if a path exists, if that's all I'm interested in is Finding out if a path exists, depth first search will do it. That's what project one with uh, stacks did, was it was doing depth first search. So it found a way to get to the island. Once you got to the island, the first mate found a way to reach the treasure. It may not be the best way, but if it's there, it'll find it. So we use a stack. Uh, when, and here's the overall algorithm. This is basically our uh, our project one pseudocode for a depth first search for a stack. So I start by marking the start as visited. I push the start location onto the stack while the stack's not empty. 
I get and pop a candidate off the stack for every, it says for each child of candidate, we could also say for everything adjacent to the candidate. So for everything adjacent to the candidate, uh, if that location is unvisited, then we mark it as visited, we put it in the stack, and we check if it's the goal. If it's the goal, we stop. And if we ever reach the point where the stack is empty, then we return failure to say we couldn't find it. Now, one thing that's important about this is we don't want to check for the goal when we pop. We want to check for the goal when we push. Let's do a really simple example. Let's say I had a big map and it's mostly ocean. And I start out, uh, let's say up here, and the treasure is right below me. So if I check when I take out, what would happen is uh, from the start, I would add this one and I would add that one. Be but because I followed the default order of Northeast Southwest, this one comes off the stack first. And from there, I add this one and this one. This one comes off. I add this one and this one. That one comes off. And I would basically, I would discover everything. I would never add the treasure because it had been already been added. And then after I had explored the entire ocean, I would pop off the top of the stack and say, oh, look, that's the treasure. So that's why we want to check when we push rather than check when we pop. With the stack, this is critical. With the queue, it can make it a little more efficient, but with the stack, it's critical that we check when we put it in, not when we take it out. So here's an example of running through the depth first search. So we're trying to get, it doesn't say what our goal is, we're trying to go, we're trying to get from A as our start, and I want to reach E is my goal. Whoops, that's a strange looking E. Anyway, we're trying to go from A to E. And we've got a few things here. We've got the unexplored vertices are colored in, I'm gonna call that blue. I'm colorblind, you can play along with me. Um, the visited vertices are gold. We've got unexplored edges. Discovery edge is, uh, discovery edge is basically saying the edge we're thinking about right now. And then a back edge is an edge that I haven't followed yet, but it gets me to some place that I've already visited, that I've already checked. Or, so uh, we start out A, our starting location is the only thing that we have visited or discovered, we could say. Uh, and in fact, I might want to go back and make these slides more consistent with the project in that respect and start saying discovered ed, uh, vertex rather than visited would be a little more consistent. So we mark A as discovered and we add things to the stack. We add B and C and D all get added to the stack. But then the one that we're looking at right now comes, and, and let's assume that we add, we push in alphabetical order. So let's assume we push in alphabetical order. So from A, I pushed B, C, D, so my stack had A on it, A came out and became the current one, and then we pushed B, C, D onto the stack in that order. So then D comes out, D becomes the current one. We pop it off the stack, and then we say, well, where can I get to from D? The only edge that exists is from D to C, but C has already been marked as true. Hey, let's just say it generically. C's already been marked as true. This is a back edge. It doesn't give me any new places to visit. So I ignore that edge and then I pop out C. So then the current, the current location becomes C. The current location is C. My stack still has B on the top of the stack. And now I try to go from places that I can reach from C. 
from C I discover E. That was my goal. I've reached my goal. And notice the stack has B on it. And according to the algorithm, I added E to the stack. And one reason I would do that is when I'm done, one way to know that I failed would be to say, hey, check the stack. If there's nothing on the stack, I must be done because I couldn't find it. And if there's anything on the stack, if it's not empty, I must have reached it because the goal must be on the stack. So that would make it a little bit easier. If we, if we always push, it makes it easier, easy to check if we reach the goal without having a separate variable. I can just see if the stack is not empty. At least the goal must be there, even if other things are also. Now, when we do a depth first search, we've got to do, we've got to perform. It says called here. We say performed. We've got to perform this depth first search for every vertex at most once because we mark them as true. We never push them again. So this is going to be performed for every vertex at most once. That means it's got to run V times. And this is the adjacency list analysis. So the adjacency list for each vertex is visited at most once. And the set of edges, we're going to assume it's distributed over the vertices. So I've got to get to a vertex. Once I get to the vertex, I've got to go through the vertex uh, adjacency list. I've got to traverse that list, and I've got to add them to the stack. So my complexity is going to be v times 1 plus e over v gives us, my, gives us the v plus e complexity. So that's how we got there. It is Now this is the, really this is the worst case complexity. The best case, it could be, hey, I go to the first vertex, I push it to the stack, I pop it, I look at the first thing it's adjacent to, and it's the treasure. So this is really the worst case analysis. So I've got to visit every vertex at most once. Every time I visit a vertex, I've got to traverse its entire adjacency list. Now, what about depth first search with an adjacency matrix? So I'm still going to have to do this for every vertex at most once because I never visit a vertex twice. As a vertex comes out of the stack, I have to go through that row of the adjacency matrix. So going through that row of the adjacency matrix is always O of V. This gives us O of V squared. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Why would you ever use an adjacency matrix? If it's O of V squared, and remember that for the adjacency list, we got O of V plus E. But remember, we said we're only going to use an adjacency list when it is sparse. And sparse means that E is proportional to V, which gives us O of V plus V, which is O of V. Now, let's contrast that with what if we did this with an adjacency list that was dense. If it's dense, then we know that E is proportional to V squared. So then O of V plus E is equal to O of e, uh, V plus V squared, which is O of V squared, which is the same as the adjacency matrix. So it's not that the adjacency matrix is inherently better. Uh, sorry, it's not that the adjacency list is inherently better. It's that when you have an, a sparse graph and you make an adjacency list, you get a better efficiency. So it's really that the important thing is that it's got to be sparse and you've got to have the right representation. If we took a sparse graph and put it in a matrix, we're going to get O of V squared. Even though there's lots of infinity symbols in there, we still have to skip over them to get to the other ones. So it's not that adjacency list is more efficient, it's that a sparse graph with an adjacency list is more efficient. Okay, what about breadth-first search? 
So if we do a breadth first search, we're going to explore this systematically still. We want to know if. I'd like to discover a shortest path. Now, that will work. I will get a shortest path if all of the edges are the same cost. If they're all cost of one, then we'll find the shortest path. However, if they're not all the same, then we've got to, if they're not all the same, we will still discover a path. So we will always discover a path. If the costs are the same, it will be a shortest path. The reason we said a shortest path there could be two paths of, say, length 3. I could go from A to B to C to F, or I could go from A to D to E to F. So there's a cost of 1, 2, 3 this way, 1, 2, 3 that way. I'll discover A shortest path. Which one do I discover first? It depends on the order I push things. But I will discover if there's more than one shortest path, I would discover one of them. Now, if the, this only is shortest if all weights are equal. If the weights are unequal, we will discover a path. We will always discover a path with this approach. So what we're going to do is basically the pseudocode here is the same, except for the word Q, back, and front instead of stack, top, and top. So that's the only thing that changes in our algorithm here. And if we look at the example, though, the example is going to be a little bit different. I said here L0 in the, in the labeling. We could have said D0, a distance of 0. I thought of this as like level 0. Level 0 is the ones that I start at. Level 1 is the ones that are 1 away. Level 2 is 2 away, etc. So here I'm trying to go from A to F. So I'm trying to go from A to F. A is my starting vertex. And we systematically discover things. And we assume also we're going to discover edges in uh, of alphabetical order. So we're going to discover adjacencies in alphabetical order. So when I start out, A is the only thing that's marked as true. So then when A comes out, I add B, then I add C, and then I add D. So this is sort of I sort of skipped the very first part where A was the only thing discovered. So A gets discovered, we take A out, we, we mark B as true, C as true, D as true, and what's in the queue right now is B, C, D, assuming this is the front. Okay, so B, C, D is in the queue. So then we go to the next slide, and B becomes the current one. So now the Q has C and D, and the current vertex is B. So B is the current vertex, C, is, C and D are still in there, and we start searching from B. So we check, well, A, A has already been, I've already followed that edge. C, I haven't followed that edge, but C has already been marked as true, so that's not useful. Uh, I can discover E, aha, so I add E to the back of the Q, and I mark it as true. Then we come around and uh, we discover uh, the so now my new current one is C. The Q has D and E in it and I start searching from C. Well C can take me to A. I've already I've already followed that edge. It can take me to B or D. I've already uh, mark both of those as true. That doesn't help me find anything new. I can go from C to E. That's nothing new. I've already marked E as true. I can also, and it's on the next slide, I can also go from C to F. So when I go from C to F, hey, F has been marked as true. It is my goal. I'm done. The only reason this one's over here is the what if. What if we didn't stop when we put it in? What if we only stopped when we took it out? Well, we would take D out of the queue. We would take E out of the queue. We would we would discover that we can't get anywhere else from those. And then we would take F out of the queue and discover that we're done. 
but really we would, according to the algorithm, we would stop at that point as soon as we mark f as true and put it in the queue. So at this point, the queue contains uh, d, e, and f. Our current vertex is c. So once I discover f and put it in, I can stop. So our analysis here with the breadth first search is exactly the same as before. With the adjacency list, we get O of V plus E. With the adjacency matrix, we get O of V squared. And again, we get the better performance from the adjacency list only when the graph is actually sparse. Now Dijkstra's algorithm, again we mentioned earlier, Dijkstra's algorithm will always find the shortest path with one assumption, which we're going to talk about later on when we get to Dijkstra's algorithm. But um, summary for today. So we did our background definitions of graphs. We looked at how to implement things memory-wise as storing an adjacency matrix or an adjacency list. We looked at our definitions of how to do infinity for the matrix, that we don't need that for the list if we've got weights. Um, we looked at depth first and breadth first search, and just a brief, brief introduction to Dijkstra's algorithm, which will be coming up soon. Okay, one reminder is uh, Professor Darden created the survey for uh, the Google form for when do you want to take the final exam, and then he discovered that it was getting weird because it only allowed people to have one entry, but you already had entries from the midterm, etc. So he wants people to, even if you've done it already, redo the form and we'll remind people uh, in a little bit, in a, probably, uh, before it's due, we'll remind anyone who hasn't done it or that we don't have a record of having done it to go do that again. So make sure you do the survey for when do you want to take the final exam so that we can start getting ready for that. All right, well, if you're done with Project 3, great. Project 4 is about ready to go. It comes out on Wednesday. And if not, I'll probably be seeing you in office hours later today.